spend most of my time as a mad scientist and professor these days. And in between times, I head up the D3 group, which is responsible for the Chalky Teeth campaign. So today, I'm, I'm focusing on the Chalky Teeth elements of it uh, as a new educational system with some patient and practitioner experience in there. And the ca campaign element is, is really trying to advocate for research because we hope that Chalky Teeth someday will become preventable and in so doing save uh, a lot of tooth decay and um, anguish out there, not to mention money. So a few words on the D3 group. The mission is better care and understanding of people with developmental dental defects. And once you've said developmental dental defects twice, you get tongue tied. Tongue -tied. So I contracted that to DDD and then came up with D3. And it's turned out for the public, I think, um, and the profession, the abstract nature of D3 is really useful. It stops you thinking too much about specifics. It's just something to do with abnormal teeth abnormally developed. So our network covers Australasia, Australia and New Zealand, and most of the effort at the moment is uh, education um, with a view to getting more research going, but we're heading towards advocacy and policy because there's no policy anywhere in the world that I know of to do with chalky teeth. The main focus is on molar hypomineralization, which for the public's benefit we call chalky teeth. More on that and the link between chalky teeth or molar hypermen and caries. So that again takes us to the research need. If we can find out what causes it and then get some medical interventions, we should be able to prevent a whole lot of caries that is not preventable by standard practice. So a lot of kids are getting caries that's unpreventable by oral hygiene, by fluoride or by avoiding sugar. So I'm now comfortable saying chalky teeth. I wasn't to start with, but when we launched the campaign in 2013, um, the final step was to get a media brief done and the consultant said, you can't possibly use the term molar hypermineralization, way too complicated. So I uh, truncated it to molar hypermin and that still wasn't good enough for this person. So I came up with chalky teeth as an experiment and it went all around the world. So that experiment worked. It's very approachable, public friendly. It's just really the professionals who know too much that may have a little bit of trouble with it to start with. But it is evocative of what we're talking about. We're talking about discoloured enamel, fragile, it's leaky and then can be painful, and it rots easily. So these are all things that, if we're explaining it to people, uh, that works. The other attractive thing is lots of people will volunteer that they were born with chalky teeth. And that's exactly the connection that we want. It is a developmental problem. So you might call it a dental birth defect, if you like. It is congenital at tooth level. Some practitioners are concerned that it's an excuse. People will use chalky teeth as an excuse for poor oral hygiene. And, and I say, well, does that matter? If, if it gets them in through the door and, and you can set them right, well, at least you've got them. So I think even if they come to you on the false pretense, at least you've got them. Chalky very easily goes down to the tooth level, to the lesion. So uh, the public can be spoken to about chalky spots. You might impress them by calling it its technical name, which is a demarcated opacity, and you might even show off your knowledge that you have to differentially diagnose that from a diffuse opacity and from hypoplasia. But chalky spot works. And then we can go to chalky molars, which again, very approachable term. It's quite correct for the severe cases, they are chalky. It fits with an earlier designation as cheese molars. MIH is a term that's been used a lot in the last 15 years you may have heard of. We're trying to move the field on from that. It's, it's, it's very specific to six-year molars and it's quite flawed in, in a number of ways. So molar hypermineralization is a better term in that you can apply it to any molar. So today we've seen some pictures of carious Ds and Es. They weren't referred to as chalky, but you, you could tell that they were chalky molars. The rest of the mouth was healthy. So molar hypermin is a term we're favouring in the meantime, but as more research is done, it's likely that will change. So it's a problem we should all be um, concerned about, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it in, in your clinics. The prevalence for the six-year molars, the sixes, is uh, about 16%, one in six kids worldwide. So that map is on the D3 website, it's interactive, you can look at those 52 studies and, and, and read the literature behind them. But one in six kids works out at about 12 million new cases a year around the world. So that's a really big global health burden. 
It brings with it a high risk for tooth decay, as I've mentioned. Um, Peter Arrow, who spoke earlier today, he, his data from WA a, a decade or so ago showed at least a tenfold risk, um, and similar data out of New Zealand. Even without the caries, a lot of hyperman teeth are hypersensitive, so you can get toothache without the caries, the enamel breaks down, the tooth might need to be extracted. So all these elements bring costs, um, socially and dentally and economically, so a, a lot of costs associated with it. And perhaps most concerning is the high level of mismanagement. It's not so bad uh, in Australia and New Zealand as in some other countries, but there is still um, a disturbing amount of under-recognition here, suboptimal treatments, no dental statistics uh, or very few dental statistics account for or take account of chalky teeth. So this really skews things like fluoridation efficacy. Fluoridation is actually working quite a bit better than the statistics say once you take account of chalky teeth, which are basically are immune to fluoride, and, and there's an absence of policy. So uh, the positive side is there's a lot that can be done. On the other hand, we've got a lot of hope that things can get better. Um, prevention is our main aim, and I, I think that is a, a, a worthy aim and, and might be reached, but certainly we can alleviate things. A and the great hope, or, or things are looking really good, is the recognition of the problem is really on the up. So the term MIH was introduced about 15 years ago, and under that umbrella is much better awareness in the dental field. It hasn't really extended out to the public much. Um, and quite a bit of research has been done on the back of, of this publicity through MIH. We've tried to broaden the, the view of the problem out to the whole mouth and both dentitions rather than just the six-year molars and, and, and sizes. So, so we're taking a whole dentition view and we're trying to connect it with caries and just saying, well, let's not get too hung up on whether it's hypermen or hyperplasia or whatever, let's just say it's an abnormal tooth and it's prone to caries. So we're introducing the term D3 caries. And we're very pleased with uh, the support we've got for that from um, a whole bunch of organisations that you can see their logos there. Uh, they're all on our website endorsing our message. And that's including the International Association of Paediatric Dentistry. So we've got up to, to world specialist level with that. So that gives us a bit of punch to, to say, yes, there are a lot of people out there who recognise um, work needs to be done. Uh, there's been some important research advances. There's been a lot of um, prevalence studies done um, and a, a smaller number of etiological investigations and they have been negative in some ways but they have eliminated some obvious candidates. So we don't know the cause of it but the uh, list of contenders is getting smaller all the time. There's also been pathological breakthroughs and including from my own laboratory. So we've now got a good idea why... Um, a single tooth can be affected, so I hope there's nobody here who would diagnose that as caries. How, how could that tooth be affected and not this one? So yes, that is an isolated chalky molar. Um, so we've got a, an understanding now why one six can be affected and the other three can't. So we hope to publish that soon. So we're, we're learning things all the time there. And we can look back in history and see there's been a good track record with, with um, overcoming DDEs, as they used to be called, D3s of, of enamel. So the tetracycline staining era has come and gone. Fluorosis in, in, in um, most populations now is well under control. And hyperplasia is 10, 15 fold lower than it was in Australia and New Zealand 30 years ago. So the general improvements in child health have, have, have largely uh, got rid of hyperplasia. So can we do the same with hypermin is the question. So I'm talking today mainly about the educational side, so how D3 is, is attacking what we're calling the chalky teeth problem. So the first thing I did was establish a cross-sector network. I, I wanted the whole field to be represented. So we have academia, we have doctors, dentists, scientists, public health people, government, and um, affected families. Over 250 from Australia and New Zealand and a whole bunch of correspondents around the world now. So we got canvassed those opinions and, and, and found who needed to know what, and brought that um, information into a comprehensive online education resource, otherwise known as a website. So it's about 100 pages deep, and it's the one-stop shop, and it seems to be working quite well, and that we've had over 2.5 million hits for this arcane subject since it was launched in, in 2013. 
Just very recently, we've put up a public landing site just to make it a bit easier to find the, the D3 one. So it's just a single page at chalkyteeth.org. So all you need to be able to remember is chalky teeth and you can, um, in one click, get through to the main site. So that's sort of what we're trying to promote now under the Chalky Teeth umbrella. So besides the websites, we've um, done a variety of educational materials. We've teamed up and done these, and they're targeted for the home and the clinic. So there's the storybook, which is up on the slide there. So that's available online and also as a glossy print reader. We've um, teamed up with industry and done some patient and dentist brochures and some stickers for the kids, as you'll see here. So a big um, focus has been on, on the kids' experience. So you can see there on the left, the, the, the kids' section on the website's got a whole bunch of stuff, starting with the online reader of the storybook and going all the way through science and, and games. In the middle are the Colgate stickers that we've done, so they're just special for Hyperman kids. And then on the right, we've got some examples of the tooth science. So we're trying to get people interested in the need for the research, um, try and make it fun with what's being done, and maybe we'll get some kids coming through wanting to actually do tooth science. Practitioner's experience, um, quite comprehensive. So there's a practitioner section there going through the things I think you'd expect. And then specialist information for pedos and orthos and medicos. And there's also general information for the public health sector and for researchers. So you can get to the literature with a single click um, and, and read any papers uh, that you like. That's all hyperlinked. So that should help you as clinicians understand. There's also network meetings and talks such as today. Um, we help you help your patients. So there's a uh, referral card to the website and that's available free and they're here today. The SAM books, as I mentioned, uh, they're available as hard copies for waiting rooms and clinics or for giving for people to take home. And we repeatedly hear how much time we are saving clinicians by providing these aids. So um, if, if you're not using them, I encourage you to. And reciprocally, we ask the people that we're helping, can they help us? Because we're totally dependent on charity um, and volunteers. So for the specialist practitioners, um, particularly, we've opened up the We Fight Ch Chalky Teeth campaign, and you can see the poster there on the right. So people who have made a substantial donation can, can get some reflection that they, one, know about chalky teeth, and two, they're supporting D3. So last slide, the, um, what I'm trying to uh, illustrate to you is, is a new model of care or of education. Um, it's very different than the old trickle-down system where, where the professor inculcates the specialists who go to the generalists who then go to the um, therapists and the families and the children. That's the trickle-down system. We've turned that upside down and um, put the kids and the families right in the middle of it and then wrapped all the others around it. And the model there really is basically crowdsourcing. Instead of having myself and other researchers saying we have to do research on this, so that's a push-up model. We're trying to get pull-up from um, politicians, basically, who realise that a whole wad of money could be saved if this problem was prevented or treated better. So the best noise is going to come from the affected people, from the public. So it's all online, so dynamic. has got obvious advantages of being online, so we can um, keep um, putting new things in and, and different people's opinions can get accommodated. And there's a lot of interest in, in growing it, uh, a lot of requests for mobile apps, and, and we'd love to do that, CPD courses all around the world, they're asking us to translate it. So we're really hopeful that we can get the resources to do that, we'd love to do that. So that's it from me, thanks for your attention. Thank you.